If you do a Google search for the phrase, God has some explaining to do, you're going to be met with tons of results from Christians and non-Christians and pretend Christians alike. Usually the articles involve suffering after some tragic event. How could God allow something terrible to happen? He's responsible and he has some explaining to do. I listened to a song titled, My God Has Some Explaining to Do. The artist sings about some general sad things in the world and then comes to this line, if I'm ever to believe that his word is true, my God has some explaining to do. In the aftermath of the Las Vegas massacre a number of years ago, Shannon Johnson Kirshner said, God has some explaining to do. Who's she? Just the pastor of a 5,500-member church in Chicago, the second largest Presbyterian church in the nation. Uh, She's also on record as saying that God is not a Christian and that Christianity is not the only way to heaven. I think she has some explaining to do, but (laughs) that's just me. Terrible things do happen to this world, to individuals and communities and to whole nations, right? We're seeing terrible things happening to nations day in and day out on the news right now. Uh, and, And the common, you know, sort of natural human response is, well, how could God allow such a tragedy? Of course, we know that all tragedy is not because of God. It is because of humans. It's because of you. It's because of me, specifically because of our sin. It was our sin ushered into the world that has caused all of these problems. And now, despite the fact that it's our mess, God works to redeem what's been lost and marred and ruined by our sin. Uh, I don't really like cleaning up other people's messes. Do you? When you go to a restaurant, do you bus anybody else's table? That would be weird. You don't even bus your own table at a restaurant because you're like, that's not my job. Of course, when you get home and, you know, your little one spills the milk all over, it's like, that's, I don't, you know, I don't want to clean up my 10th, you know, jug of milk today, but I love them. And so I'm going to clean it up. And so uh, we don't like cleaning up other people's messes, but sometimes we do it because we know you know, we love that person and, and for whatever reason. But this is the God of the universe who made everything perfect, who made everything right, who made everything good. We came in and we said, we have an idea. What if we ruined all of this and then just went on ruining it in all sorts of terrible ways? And the Lord says, okay, well, why don't I work tirelessly to redeem what your sin has ruined? The truth is, God does not need to explain anything to us. He's the creator. We are the creatures. And yet, he loves to explain himself to us. A God who reveals, or a God who communicates, a God who goes, you know, as far as he can again and again and again to make himself known, to explain to us what's going on. He has gone to considerable trouble to reveal and contextualize and instruct and help us understand why things are the way that they are. And then beyond that, how we can partner with him so that more lives can be saved, more societies can be benefited, more redemption can take place around this world that is so beset with tragedy and failure. So the book of Nahum is all about God revealing that a terrible thing is going to happen to a terrible empire, but then also explaining why. Why is this happening? It wasn't because he's a God who delights in human suffering. You hear about some of these pagan gods in other mythologies. We think of Greek gods all the time. You know, they delight in messing with the people of earth and playing tricks on them and oppressing them. God does not delight in human suffering. He he explains that this is happening because when he offered life and help and forgiveness and a way forward that offer was rejected. Not just once, but again and again and again, decade after decade by this empire, Assyria. So in this text in particular, in Nahum chapter three, we see a list of why Nineveh was doomed. And the Lord does that not only to show that he is a just God and that he is a righteous God and he is a God who has true moral standards that he applies evenly to everyone, but he's also giving this, recording it, 
preserving it, delivering it, so that other people, other societies can avoid Assyria's fate. He doesn't want Nineveh to happen to other societies. Uh, but, and so he gives this revelation. He says, hey, this is what happens when you refuse to go my way. So why don't you just go my way so that this doesn't have to happen? Verse one begins, woe to the city of blood, totally deceitful, full of plunder, never without prey. Nineveh, uh, if you've been here for the last number of studies, you've heard the extreme levels of violence that were commonplace, normal, celebrated in the Assyrian culture. They were guilty of violence, of deceit, of robbery, of oppression. And they were unmatched in these things, unmatched in brutality. Did you know it was the Assyrians who invented crucifixion? Not the Romans. The Assyrians were the ones sitting around and saying, how could we really kill a guy? (laughs) These were cities where you would walk through the gates of the city and you would see lots of people impaled on sticks, slowly dying. You're like, oh yeah, this, okay, so over here's our library, and if you head that way, you're gonna go, and then these are some people here, these people moaning. I couldn't really hear you over the moaning of the crucified and impaled people over here. And the Assyrians are like, oh yeah, this is our, this is our cool crucifixion garden over here. Make sure you hit that up too. They decorated their palaces with the remains of their victims. They displayed their enemies in merciless, barbarous ways around town. Assyrian diplomacy, if that's an actual term, it was based on lies and intimidation and force. They would go and make peace with a people and then attack them after making the peace. They would often break truces. They would break their promises to other nations. When Assyria besieged Jerusalem, we see that the messenger comes and he promises everyone's going to have their own fig tree, everyone's going to have their own vine, everyone's going to have their own sister, and it's going to be great. Just open the gates to us, give in to us, and you'll live in peace and prosperity. But what was the reality when you did business with Assyria? Well, let's look at the example of Manasseh, who was king, we believe, during Nahum's time. We read this in Second Chronicles 33. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people. They didn't listen, so he brought against them the military commanders of the king of Assyria. They captured Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze shackles, took him to Babylon. That was their diplomacy. They would tell you one thing, and then suddenly you had a fish hook passed through your jaw, and you were being dragged naked to some place you'd never been before. Assyria didn't just take. They ripped apart. That's the term that Nahum uses here when he talks about the things that they're preying on. They delighted in violence and oppression. And so as a result, God says, hey, I'm pronouncing a woe on your city. And and Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And as we've talked about, this is going to extend to the entire empire. The Old Testament prophets use this term woe a lot, about 50 times. It was most often used as a warning that, hey, God's physical chastisement and judgment is coming to you because of the things that you've been doing. But it was also used as a lament for the dead. A, a mourning sound for someone who had died. And, and it, it kind of just tips the hat a little bit to the fact that God wasn't happy that these people were going to die. What did God do in the book of Jonah? And why did he do it? He says, I love the people of Nineveh. I don't want them to die. I don't want to judge them for their sin. I have to if they refuse my mercy and they refuse to be saved. But But man, I'm going to lament over the fact that this judgment is going to fall on them. God had waited for decades, maybe centuries, for the Ninevites, specifically the Assyrians in general, to turn from their sin, to show some sign of repentance, but it never came. And so the only option was wrath, and that offer of mercy finally expired. That's what Nahum's all about. Verse two says, the crack of the whip, the rumble of the wheel, galloping horse, jolting chariot. 
The Assyrians reaped what they sowed. That's what we're seeing here. Some commentators are like, okay, this is a picture of what the Assyrians did to other people. Other commentators are like, no, this is a picture of what's going to happen to them. And both of them are effectively true because the Assyrians reaped what they sowed. This is a a bedrock principle of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Paul says in Galatians 6, God's not going to be mocked. Don't be deceived what a man sows he's going to reap. If you're going to reap to the flesh, you're going to Sorry, if you're going to sow to the flesh, you're going to reap destruction and death. If you sow to the spirit, you're going to reap life. And so they were reaping what they sowed. The choices that you make and that I make come with consequences. Now, they don't always come with the, all of the consequences that we deserve for mistakes or for sin or for rebellion, but sin always comes bundled with consequences. We do reap what we sow. The Assyrians had been the attackers. Now they were going to be the victims. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap destruction. Here in verse two, Nahum focuses on the sounds. We're a really visual, you know, people. We're all about video. We're all about, you know, big, bold, but but we want to try to put ourselves into just the, the literary uh, richness of Nahum. And as we've talked about before, you know, he's considered by a lot of Bible scholars just the poet laureate of the Old Testament. Uh, these scholars, even some that aren't believers, talk about how his poetry is unrivaled. We lose some of that in the English. That's okay. But he, think of the sounds here, crack of the whip, the rumble of the wheel, the pounding of hooves on the pavement and, and over enemies. This year, the Academy Award for Best Sound didn't go to a sci-fi epic, didn't go to an action adventure full of explosions or car chases, didn't go to Mission Impossible, didn't go to Dune. Do you know who it went to? It went to a movie called The Zone of Interest. I'm guessing that most people in here haven't seen it and haven't heard of it. I haven't seen it. Uh, But it tells the story of the regular day-to-day family life of the commandant of Auschwitz who lived in a house just outside the camp, next to the camp. And like I said, I haven't seen the movie, but I've seen a few clips. And it'll show, you know, the wife and the kids, they're out on their lawn playing. And it's just a regular day and they're hanging out with flowers and things like that. And, And the scene is very quiet. And you just hear in the background the muffled sounds of what was going on in that concentration camp. And it is horrifying and it is haunting. And you realize, oh yeah, if we're going to give an award for most moving use of sound, uh, a car chase does not cut it this year. Uh, the, the one scene I saw alone, I'm like, give them the award. Uh, it, it was just haunting and sickening. The wholesale destruction of a people that you could hear. And that's what Assyria is doomed for. And that's the images that, that Nahum is putting in our minds first using sound. In verse three, he moves to sights, charging horsemen, flashing sword, shining spear, heaps of slain, mounds of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over their dead. And so the sights of judgment, uh, even worse than the sounds, perhaps. The warfare was so savage when the Babylonians and Medes came and overthrew Nineveh and the suburbs around Nineveh the war was so savage that even the Babylonians in their historical chronicles, they called what happened an evil thing. And they're the ones that did it, right? They said, hey, write down what happened at that battle that we were victorious in. And in the Babylonian chronicles, they say an evil thing happened. It was so bad. It was so vicious. It was so awful. Of course, Assyrian kings used to pile up corpses of their enemies. Last study, we heard some of their, their taunts, some of their boasts, all of these Assyrian kings. We have many of their annals where they wrote down how great they were and the great things they did. And they loved to talk about the heaps of heads and the piles of bodies and these people that I draped over here and these people I impaled over there. They were so excited about it. They would parade mangled and disfigured captives through the city before slaughtering them like animals. And, and like I said, they, they would decorate their palaces with dead people. And now what's happening? Um, the Lord says, okay, well, you, you get to become part of the furniture too. This is, this is the life that you want. Okay, I'm going to let you have it. And this is a principle too uh, that the Bible explains that the Lord reaches out to us. He says, I'm trying to save you. I'm trying to save you from yourself. I'm trying to save you from 
the inevitable end of the, the path that you are on. It is going to end in death. It is going to end in ruin. It is going to end in destruction. And when human beings say, no, I refuse, I refuse, I refuse, ultimately God says to them, fine, then have your way and have it all the way. You know, Hezekiah, the king, he, you know, the Lord sends the prophet to him and he says, tell him you're going to upset your house in order you're going to die. And then Hezekiah throws a fit about it. Okay. And so the Lord says, all right, I'm going to give you 15 more years. It was in that 15 years, by the way, that he had his son Manasseh, who did more evil than anyone else had in the kingdom of Judah, according to the Old Testament. But so then he gets better and then the Babylonians come and he's so excited about the Babylonians. He wants so bad to be friends with the Babylonians. He wants so bad to impress them. And he shows them all of their stuff. And, and, and he says, look at all of our treasures and look at all of this stuff. And, and, um, and the Lord says, you know, if you're so excited about the Babylonians, you can go live with the Babylonians for how about like 70 years? And it wasn't just because of what Hezekiah did, but this is a principle of scripture that the Lord says, I'm really trying to help you here. I'm trying to keep you from drinking this poison to yourself. And when human beings or human society say, no, we want the poison, the Lord says, you can have it and you're going to drink it all and it's going to go very badly for you. And, uh, you know, I'll be here when, if you want to fall on my grace and, and receive my mercy. It's one of the most frustrating passages. I, I, I'm, I guess I'm not a very merciful person. One of the most frustrating passages in the Old Testament is the fact that Manasseh, the king during Nahum's time, who it says he did more evil than anybody, more evil than the Canaanites. Like just, he did so much evil. And we just read here that the, the Lord was like, I tried to talk to him and he just refused. And you read all of these things that Man Manasseh did. And then finally he's, he, judgment falls and he's taken off to Babylon. You're like, finally got rid of that guy. And what happens? He realizes, oh man, I've fallen into sin. I should call out to the Lord. And he calls out to the Lord and the Lord forgives him. <laughs> you're like, what? You know? And if you're a black-hearted sinner like me, you're just like, that's not right. I want that guy to suffer, you know? And the Lord's like, hey, I told you this is what was going to happen. I wanted to save you. I still want to save you. You've done more evil than anybody else in the history of your nation, and I want to save you. And I will save you if you will repent and turn towards me. And so Assyrian kings are going to become part of the furniture here where once they had an endless heap of treasure, now they had an endless pile of death. This is the inevitable result of a life in rebellion against God. This is what happens. Oh, no, maybe it doesn't happen to each individual person physically on this side of eternity, but the pictures we're seeing here, that is the end result of a life in rebellion against God, in rejection of Jesus Christ, embracing sin. In the end, it's just death where you thought was wealth, where you thought was strength, where you thought was prominence and power and position, it's all gone and it's just replaced with just death, hopelessness, separation, and, uh, and that's not what we want. Verse four, because of the continual prostitution of the prostitute, the attractive mistress of sorcery who treats nations and clans like merchandise by her prostitution and sor sorcery, in addition to the lies and the violence and the oppression and the greed, Assyria was deep into idolatry and sorcery and immorality of every kind. Uh, this second list is added to the charges of verse 1. The Assyrian kings Esarhaddon and Ashurbanipal, who we believe was the king during Nahum's time, had almost fanatical devotion to divination, according to historians. The library of Nineveh. Uh, we've discovered many tablets full of occult rituals and incantations. There were incantations for farmers, uh, incantations for when you were going to go meet a public official. They would divine using oil or the entrails of slaughtered animals. They were deep into reading the liver, all of this weird stuff. And then there was the idolatry. Assyria worshipped a variety of gods. They were particularly fond of Ishtar. And they, her followers, often referred to her as the prostitute. On top of these practices, Assyria would entice other nations to take on their culture, to join with them, to become like them, and then they would consume those nations. They would destroy them. 
During Nahum's time, King Manasseh was converting the temple of Jerusalem to be a pagan temple. Altars to Baal, poles for Asherah, altars to the stars of the sky. We're told he burned his sons alive for these pagan gods. We're told he did all sorts of witchcraft and divination just like the Assyrians. He was enamored and enticed by their wealth and their power and their culture. And what happened? You know, I want to be your friend, Assyria. Well, we already read it. What did they want? Oh, we want to put hooks in you and drag you away. That's what we're about. Isn't that a sad thing? Manasseh's like, I want to be your buddy. I want what you guys have. I'm going to make myself like you. Hey, look, we wear the same shoes now. Hey, look, we burn our children just like you do. And they say, okay, great. Hey, can you come here real quick? This guy, who, the guy with the hooks, yeah, he would like a word with you. You're, you're headed this way. Uh, but that's what sin does. Sin didn't care about him, right? The Assyrians wanted his money. They wanted his territory. They wanted his life. And he's like, well, I want to be like you guys. I want to have the cool stuff like you guys have. And instead, what happened? They came in, ensnared him, dragged him off with hooks, ruined his life forever. And it's a, it's a devotional picture for us of what happens when we give ourselves over to the flesh, give ourselves over to sin. We think sin's our friend because it's pleasurable for a time. We think sin is going to help us. We think sin is going to augment and benefit our life. And what does it do? Traps us, destroys, tears us apart, ruins our life. It, 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 it pulls us apart the way that Assyria did to their enemies. Verse 5, God says, I am against you. Second time he said that to Nineveh. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. I'll lift your skirts over your face and display your nakedness to the nations, your shame to kingdoms. The action here in verse 5 is shocking, uh, but God is simply exposing what the Assyrian culture is already doing. It sort of reminds me of those popular social media accounts right now that just repost what other people post on TikTok and things like that, and everybody's all up in arms. How dare you repost that? How dare you show what, what, what you posted, what you put as a reel, what you filmed and broadcast out to the world? Yeah, don't, don't repost that. That doesn't make any sense at all to me, except for that it is exposing evil. It's exposing wickedness and saying, hey, take a look. And so the Lord is saying that. I'm showing what you're doing. The language is harsh, but the Lord is saying to the world, listen, you think Assyria is the queen of the earth right now? You think she is the strongest, greatest, most enviable empire? Take a look. After I remove the trappings of power, after I remove the palaces and the gold and the art and the finery, now look behind the curtain and see what's underneath. It's not pretty. It, it, it's It's shameful. I think our tendency as sort of New Testament Christians is to read verse 5 and feel a little bit uncomfortable and say, man, Lord, not very loving, right? But the truth is it would be unloving for God not to judge Assyria, not to warn the world about what it means when you're Assyrian in your culture or in your behavior. They had victimized the whole world for centuries and had refused to go God's way even when he gave them a gracious, merciful chance again and again and again, year after year, decade after decade. And now it was time for the reckoning. Now it was time to pay the bill. Every culture, every person must face their creator one day. The accounts will be settled. Judgment has to happen. If you want to stand before God in your own strength, in your own ability, in your own merit, you can, but you're going to be like Assyria. There's not going to be anything left. You're going to be uncovered before him. And all that will be seen is your guilt and your shame. And you will be found guilty and sent into destruction. But if you're willing to turn from your sin and receive salvation, then what happens? Well, then God, by his grace, what does he do? He clothes you in his righteousness. Your guilt is covered. Your shame is taken away. You are are robed in the righteousness, the rich robe of righteousness from Jesus Christ. And when God looks at you, he sees you perfect and redeemed in his son. And instead of your shame being on display, he says, I took your shame and I cast it as far as the east is from the west. It's gone. Nobody needs to remember that anymore. 
And instead of seeing shame, he looks at his people and he says, I now see the immeasurable riches of my grace on display through you. Not shame, not guilt, not mistakes, not falling short. He says, I see and I'm going to display the riches of grace through your life. Verse six, I'll throw filth on you and treat you with contempt. I will make a spectacle of you. Our buddy, Ashurbanipal, he once captured an enemy leader and put him on display as a fun spectacle for his people. Here's what the king wrote about that guy. He said, I pierced his chin with my keen hand dagger. Through his jaw, I passed a rope, put a dog chain upon him, and made him occupy a kennel of the east gate of Nineveh. We know at another time, one of these kings, they would put defeated foes uh, in a cage with a hungry bear and watch them be slowly devoured. You know, that was their fun entertainment. That's the spectacles they like to put on display. And so again, the Lord is saying, "Uh, okay, let's do it. If this is how you want to do things, we're going to do things this way. This is what you want to sow into the ground. This is what the kind of fruit you want to grow. Okay, now you get to reap the harvest of this plant that you planted. Sin is awful. I hope we walk away from Nahum just shocked at the, the, the sin and the brutality of the Assyrian Empire and realize, yeah, they're, they're people like we are people. I'm not saying we're the same as Assyrians or our culture is the same as the Assyrians, but sin is awful. James explains to us that when sin is fully grown, what does it do? It gives birth to death. Not sometimes, every time, all the time. That's what it does. Now, most of us don't act like Assyrian kings, but sin is the same, right? Sin in my heart is the same as the sin in Ashurbanipal's heart. It just might not be as uh, violent and ugly because we live in a society of law and order, right? Sin bears the same fruit in a heart. And God simply cannot pretend like sin isn't a big deal. He must judge it. It is right for him to do so. He, he has to settle the accounts. When an individual continues in a life of sin, the result is waste and ruin and ultimately death. When a nation continues in a culture of sin and rebellion against God, the result is Assyria. Not just the horrors of the culture, but ultimately the bringing down the destruction of that nation. God says there, I'm going to treat you with contempt. Your version may say, make you vile. Literally, the words can read, I'm going to treat you as a fool. You're going to be a fool, spiritually speaking, then I'm going to treat you as a fool. The Assyrians were fools. God himself had revealed the truth to them a hundred years ago through Jonah, his prophet. And, and, and they said, okay, we'll repent. And then he, he said, okay, then I won't judge you. And then they said, why don't we just go back to all the things we were doing before and even do it more so? They were fools. They could have escaped judgment, but they wouldn't turn to God. And so God allowed them to go their own way. And this is the result. Verse seven, then all who see you will recoil from you saying, Nineveh's devastated. Who's gonna show sympathy to her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? Not only was no one going to show them sympathy. We'll see at the end of the book that everyone in the world is going to applaud uh, everything that's happening to them. Can you imagine? Can you imagine some tragic thing happening and all of your neighbors coming out and saying, about time. (laughs) You know, we hear people say, I'm going to dance on their grave. That's what happened, but for real, to an entire empire. None of Assyria's peers around the world thought God was going too far with what sort of wrath he poured out on this nation. To all of them, it was a long time coming. Oh, finally, are these guys gone now? Good. That's how evil they were. That's how ripe for judgment they were. In the end, there was no one there to comfort Assyria. And the saddest part of that statement is the fact that God himself had wanted to be their comforter. That's always what he wants. What did we read in the first chapter of Nahum? Nahum 1, 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in a day of distress. He cares for those who take refuge in him. That could have included the Assyrians if they would have taken refuge in him, but they wouldn't. Instead, they said, no, we're gonna go our way. We like our culture. We like our weapons. We like our chances on our own. And the Lord says, well... Unfortunately for you, you may be the strongest guy in the room, but I'm coming on the clouds and I'm coming and there's not going to be anything left. 
Worst of all, the nation of Judah, God's people, they were going the same way. In verse one, Nineveh was called the city of blood. Did you know that both before Nahum and after Nahum in different prophetic books, other prophets would call Jerusalem a city of blood built on a foundation of bloodshed? In Micah chapter three, God said to the leaders of Israel, you know, you guys tear off other people's skin and devour them. Kind of sounds like the Assyrians, right? In Hosea, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the Lord, Lord repeatedly tells his people, you guys are guilty of harlotry and spiritual prostitution. You're acting like the Assyrians. What are you doing? And yet, what do we see in that section of 2 Kings, that section of 2 Chronicles? They're like, could we be more like Assyria? We think that would be awesome. The Assyrians are not just some tall tale. They're not just some, you know, campfire ghost story. Oh, that, you know, they're an example. An example of what happens when even God's people turn towards sin and, and buy into the culture of the world. They show what happens when a people turn from the Lord and refuse the Lord and reject the Lord. The end is the death of their nation. The only way for a people to find refuge and comfort and redemption is by running to the Lord and receiving his mercy to turn their backs on greed and injustice and violence and immorality and instead say, we believe God. We trust that his way is the only way to life. And so let's go that way. That's exactly what happened in the city of Nineveh in the book of Jonah. And now what's happening? Nineveh's going 100 miles an hour the opposite direction. And Judah's like, hey, the Assyrians just completely destroyed the nation of Israel, all 10 tribes. They're all dead and God. What if we were more like the Assyrians? This is a great idea. We've had a great idea, a great meeting, everyone. Let's convert our temple to be like an Assyrian temple. Let's do all of these different things. As individuals and as a nation, we have this same choice. It's always the choice for any individual, any family, any community, any nation. The Assyrian way, the world's way comes along and says, hey, go with us. Everyone will get their own cistern and their own vine, their own fig tree. It's all going to be great. It's all lies, of course. They say, hey, pay no attention to the mounds of bodies behind us. Uh, that's not going to happen to you guys. It'll all work out for you guys. But meanwhile, the Lord says, listen, don't go that way. That way is just death. It only ends in death. It only ends in ruin. Why don't you go my way? And my way, the result is rest and life and hope. Listen to what God promises about his kingdom. Now, this is speaking about the kingdom in, in the book of Micah, but the Lord says, here's what happens when you go my way. This is Micah chapter four. It says, God will settle disputes among many peoples and provide arbitration to strong nations that are far away. They'll beat their swords into plows and their spears into pruning knives. Nation will not take up sword against nation. They will never again train for war, but each person will sit under his grapevine, under his fig tree with no one to frighten him. And so the world offers what the Lord offers, only the world is lying. Sin is lying. And you can see, it's very obvious that they're lying. And the Lord says, I will do this if you will go my way. I will, I will give you all these things. I created the universe so that I could give you these things if you will go my way. How's our nation doing? How Assyrian are we, given this list? Are we guilty of bloodshed? of deceit, of greed, oppression? How about idolatry, sorcery, immorality? I, I just gotta share this. Yesterday I watched whatever random like YouTube video and then immediately after, this is the ad that started playing. The opening line was, can ancient witchcraft unlock the secret to luxuriant hair growth? <laughs> it was mind boggling. I thought, what? But, you know, on all of these things, man, our nation, our culture, it feels very Assyrian. It feels very excited to be more like the Assyrians, not set apart to be like the Lord. Our nation needs revival. And that starts with me, right? That starts with us. It doesn't start with the other guy over there. It starts with me. The, that's what Nahum said to, God said to his people through Nahum and says, okay, listen, here's what's going on in the world. Here's what's going on with judgment. Here's what I want you to do. You stay set apart. You follow me. You keep your vows. You celebrate your relationship with me. Keep my feasts. Do those things. King Manasseh's doing whatever he's gonna do. This is what you can do. 
be revived in your own heart. But our nation needs revival. It starts with me. It starts with us. But man, our nation needs a Jonah 3 moment so that we don't have a Nahum 3 moment. And uh, we just need to pray and be people who are set apart and who are about our relationship with Christ and about walking with the Lord even when the culture doesn't. Have you heard it said that Shakespeare's comedies end with a wedding and the tragedies end in death or a funeral? That's really the choice before us. You can go with the Lord. Uh, Life might not be a laugh riot, but it will be full of joy leading to the wedding feast of the Lamb. If we go our way, well, we're going to be in a tragedy, and the result will be death and judgment. God has explained all of this. He has set before us life and death, blessing and cursing. Let's choose wisely.